U.S. bases in Europe are on the highest alert for a decade. This key American and Polish supply hub, an hour from Ukraine, peppered with air defense. And this Ukrainian cargo plane from Norway, a major part of NATO's weapons supplies to Kiev. You're watching an odd paradox. The largest, loudest arming effort of our times happening in near secrecy, fences obscuring what they can. The main reason? The threat of Russian sabotage. Persistent, real, growing across Europe along the supply lines to the Ukrainian border here. Well, supply hubs like these have never really been more vital for Ukraine trying to hold the front line. But a senior NATO official has told me of a six to nine months effort by Russia to sabotage NATO weapon supplies into Ukraine. A fair bit of it going right down these tracks. Now, they described it as something that is against, at times, the point of production, against those making the decisions, against the storage of the weapons or even their actual delivery, saying the operation has been bold. It too is something in the shadows with a huge potential for escalation. This is the moment first broadcast here. A vast saboteur operation in Poland gave itself away. Caught on camera is Maxim, a 24-year-old Ukrainian living here, recruited online by Russian agents who first just asked him to daub anti-war graffiti, filmed buying a lot of energy drinks, a move that led Polish agents to arrest him and 15 others because he dropped a receipt from here at a crime scene. His Russian handler, Andrei, had begun asking for much more, positioning cameras, some here, overlooking these tracks to Ukraine, others where Poland trained Ukrainian troops, and for Maxim to commit arson. In all, it got him six years in jail. Amazing how the Russians are just recruiting people straight off Telegram who find themselves here in maximum security. He gave our producer a rare interview inside. We could not record, so an actor is voicing his words. It was easy money. I needed money badly. I didn't think any of it could cause any harm. It seemed so insignificant. When Andre told me to install cameras where Poles were training Ukrainian soldiers, that's when I knew it could be serious. It made me feel uneasy. That was when I decided I'd quit. But I never got a chance. I got arrested the next day. Put together, suspected Russian sabotage is quite widespread, with arson around Poland, at an ammo depot and even a shopping centre. Concerns voiced over a fire at a key Berlin metals factory. Czech officials have pointed at Russia over railway hacking. France arrested a pro-Russian separatist plotting to blow up a Paris hardware store. And last month, intelligence chiefs warned on a Swedish island close to Russia, there was an increased risk of sabotage of weapons bound for Ukraine. But it gets fiercer here, right next to Russia in Estonia. Russia's appetite to disrupt led them, at this tense border crossing, one May night, to sneak out in these thermal camera images and remove the buoys marking where Estonia ends and Russia begins, literally removing the border. Tank traps and razor wires speak of how bad it's got. Estonian GPS signals have been jammed in the skies above. Russians film us filming them. Your job is also to, to filter out any of the Russian agents who might be being used to come and do hybrid attacks, right? All the time, 24-7, and uh, trying to filter those people out. I think the Russians now are trying to see how we will react to different things. Security officials say Russia is using amateurs here too. Ten people arrested in February after an attack on the Estonian interior minister's car. Fears the Ukraine war may in the future, make Russians more aggressive still. We saw a significant rise in their activity in the last autumn. We have seen it moving towards physical uh, attacks. Yes, they are at the moment were against, more against property. There are people who take part in the war against Ukraine. They have war experience. Their mindset is more violent. They are perhaps not so patient anymore trying to get results. A shadowy standoff where the unthinkable in a matter of months becomes reality. 
This is really the huge risk from the sabotage, these hybrid operations, that they're farmed out so often to local petty criminals who may not have total control over how far they go, may make mistakes, may cause casualties that were unintended, but essentially also too, it calls into question exactly what level of command and control Vladimir Putin ultimately has on each one of these probes of NATO's defences that could ultimately, if they go too far, lead in a full-fledged NATO military response. Nick Payton Walsh, CNN, Narva, Estonia. A jump too far to bring to an end Katerina Tabashnik's Olympic hopes for Paris. But the Ukrainian high jumper bowed out with a smile to a knowing, warm reception from those watching on. Having struggled with injuries in recent weeks, she cleared 1.89 metres at the National Athletics Championships in Lviv, not enough to qualify for the Games. But a moment that would have been beyond the realms of most, given what the 30-year-old has been through in the last few years. The loss of my home, the loss of my dear mother, the loss of my friends. And all this takes strength, takes energy. It's like a poison for the body. Katerina's mother, Tetiana, was killed when a Russian airstrike struck her apartment building two years ago. She had returned to Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, to help care for her young grandson, Katerina's nephew, who was seriously injured in a previous attack. Katerina was told of the news by phone, confronted by her home in ruins, and serious questions about whether she wanted to continue her athletics career. What has kept you going? How have you got through it? I guess it's belief. You can't imagine how many times I wanted to give it all up, give up on sports, on jumping. But every time I pull myself together and say, no, now I have to fight like never before. Remarkably, channeling that fight saw Katerina win her first medal at a major event, claiming an emotional bronze at the European Championships last year, which she dedicated to her mother. It hurts that I can't hear her, call her, like I always did. But she tells me in my dreams that I will succeed. Any elite athlete will tell you how success depends on consistency, stability and the ability to have a single-minded focus on the job in hand. All luxuries that most Ukrainian athletes aren't afforded in the face of Russia's full-scale invasion. Theirs is a team enduring grief, destruction of their homes and sports facilities, family members sent to war, and life where sporting success is now being seen through a very different prism. And over the next few weeks, those heading to Paris may be forced to come face to face with a number of the Russian and Belarusian sports people to have been allowed to compete at the Olympics as neutral athletes, thanks to a ruling from the International Olympic Committee. In the 21st century, this is an unacceptable attitude when people are dying, people in one country and another country wants to live freely with impunity, without responsibility. Words from the heart and first-hand experience from an athlete who's suffered tragedy that has only strengthened her drive to reach new heights in her fight for her country. Amanda Davis, CNN, Lviv.